Welcome to the Ultimate Music Teacher's Productivity and Profitability Podcast. I'm your host, Glory St. Germain. Tune in to discover how you can unleash your teaching potential and turn your passion for music education into profit. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Music Teacher's Productivity and Profitability Podcast. My very special guest today is an extraordinary individual whose journey from the world of music to the realm of technology and marketing is nothing short of remarkable. At the age of 12, can you imagine, she already had graced the stage at every stage, as a matter of fact, at the Lincoln Center and she's going to be sharing a little bit more about that, uh, showcasing her remarkable talents as a pianist and dancer and a singer. But her story doesn't stop there. It's a fascinating twist that she actually challenged her passion for music into the creation of the groundbreaking platform Duet Partner. You're going to be hearing about that today. Designed to empower music teachers, music entrepreneurs like you, and help them manage their music studios with unwavering confidence. I can't wait to hear more. As she said, it's really built by music teachers for music teachers. And Duet Partner is the only studio manager that's really worthy of an encore. So in addition to this incredible achievement, she has been at the forefront of the duet rebrand and rebuild, driving innovation into the music industry for the past two years. And it is a pleasure to introduce the multi-talented and true pioneer of the fusion of music and technology, Naylan McBain. Welcome, Naylan. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Glory. How are you? Very good. If you don't mind, could you do a little, before we dive into all of our questions, can you do a little intro to yourself about kind of where you started and what's driving your passion right now? Yes, I was raised as one of those New York City kids that is just steeped in arts and culture. And I grew up in New York, uh, right across the street from Lincoln Center in the 80s and the 90s. My mom was a soloist at the Metropolitan Opera, and she sang almost 500 performances there as a mezzo-soprano. And so I kind of grew up, you know, just with that as my life. I don't think I even heard of the Beatles until I was in like middle school, you know, it was like a very much of a bubble, but it was wonderful and loved, you know, visual arts as well, and as well as the performing arts. And so my parents kind of funneled me into that life. And so I started taking ballet at the School of American Ballet and eventually went to Juilliard in high school for their pre-college program as a solo pianist. And I also sang at the Metropolitan Opera Children's Choir. So between all of those things, yes, I I performed on the stages of Lincoln Center very early on in my life in the Nutcracker and in various operas and performances that School of American Ballet did at actually what was called then Avery Fisher Hall. And so, yeah, it was a really wonderful way to grow up. Well, I guess it sounds so fun. And yes, there's this group called the Beatles. <laughs> yes, I, I eventually figured that out. <laughs> oh, well, you know, do you have a funny story or a memorable moment from one of your performances at the Lincoln Center that that really impacted you that you'd like to share? Yes, I have lots. One of the most poignant was when my mom and I were both in Madam Butterfly together. There is a children's chorus part in Madam Butterfly. And then my mother was playing Suzuki, uh, the role of Suzuki, who is Butterfly's companion, the the mezzo role. So we were on stage together. But the funny, one of the funny ones, there's lots, but one of the funny ones came when I was younger, probably about three years old. My mom was singing Hansel in Hansel and Gretel, Humperdinck's opera, Hansel and Gretel. And I think a babysitter brought me to a dress rehearsal in the main auditorium. And So if you're familiar with the story of Hansel and Gretel, you may remember that Hansel gets put into an oven at one point (laughs) by this horrible witch. And apparently I stood up on my chair in the middle of the rehearsal and I said, don't put my mommy in the oven. (laughs) And they had to stop the rehearsal and she had to come down from the stage to console me (gasps) because I was very, very distraught. Oh my God. That is so cute. I mean, can you imagine the torment? I hope it didn't haunt you for too long to go. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember it. No, but, but it became a, 
a famous story. And, yes. you know, I, I just I remember lots of backstage shenanigans. There was a dresser, so somebody who helped the singers get into their costumes. And, you know, when the singers are on stage, the dressers don't have a lot to do. So when I would be backstage with my mom during a performance, the dresser, her name was Arlene. I remember she would help me crochet uh, clothes for my Cabbage Patch kids. Um, And so I loved Arlene. And sometimes the makeup artists would do me up and kind of, you know, just have fun with me while my, while the singers were all on stage. So it was fun. Oh, that, what a life, right? What a life. I mean, you've gone from seeing your mom being put in the oven to having your hair and makeup done backstage while (laughs) crocheting for the cabbage bed. I'm sure you were very entertaining and dear to their hearts as well. When, when I really, I, I just admire you so much and we've had a chance and, you know, you've really graciously had me, you know, do a masterclass for piano duet partners as well. And one of the things I look at is just the diverse background, you know, from performing on stages at Lincoln Center to transitioning into technology and marketing. It's that's a huge, that's a huge transition. So how did your early experiences in music just kind of shape your approach to to building duet partner and and why did you even want to do this, Madeline? Yeah. Well, to be clear, it's been many decades since I was on any of those stages. And so a lot has happened in between. I went to college at Yale where I was actually an English major and I also focused on music performance. So at Yale, you know, my music interests continued. I was an accompanist for the Yale School of Music singers. Love that. I started the Yale College Opera Company while I was there for the undergraduates. I was the music critic for the Yale Daily News. So you know, it was a huge part of my experience at Yale. And so I, I graduated and I went to San Francisco I, because, you know, going back to New York was going to be too boring. That was just home. And I wanted to get away from home. Right. So I went to San Francisco and I really thought I had family there. That's where my family, my extended family was. And I really thought I would just waltz into an arts administration job, you know, <laughs> at the opera or the symphony or one of the performing arts organizations there. And it wasn't that easy. And this was 1999. And I, you know, I, looking back on it, I think I, I was definitely overconfident. I think I definitely felt entitled, you know, to just, well, why wouldn't you want to hire me? You know, and I, it probably came across in my interviews. And I also think that, you know, arts administration is one of those industries where you kind of have to earn your stripes, right? I, I probably needed a couple of years at the Fresno Philharmonic or, you know, the, the Modesto, something, you know, right in central Cal, like something smaller where I really kind of climbed the ropes rather than just waltzing into the San Francisco opera, but I couldn't get a job. And I tried for about a year. And so because it was 1999, I, I finally just gave in and joined Silicon Valley. And I, uh, yeah, so I, I started in online marketing with a couple of companies in Silicon Valley. I did PR, I did copywriting, I built some of the early kiosks that went into the stores for Walmart. So I eventually started working for walmart.com, which was a fascinating experience and really an amazing education in e-commerce and and retail and building out some of that early technology that was bridging the store experience with the e-commerce experience. And so I ended up staying there for almost seven years. And that kind of put me on a whole different path, of course, where I really focused on advertising and marketing and eventually uh, brand strategy within advertising agencies. So helping brands develop their voice and tone and really hone in on particular customer bases and refine their product offerings so that they were really meeting the needs of particular audiences. So that really was what my career ended up being in. And I then eventually had an opportunity just a few years ago to do something totally different. And I was really excited about this opportunity because I'd wanted to get back into music at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I play minimally myself these days, but I have two of my three children are very advanced musicians and I'm kind of still very much a supporter of that world and you know, a, a very enthusiastic audience member. <laughs> and so, which is important, right? We, yes. all, need, we all need yes. our audience. Obviously, yes. we couldn't sur- couldn't survive without the audience. And so I was talking to my husband and I, and I just thought, you know, it'd be so wonderful to do something that supports the music teachers that have been so critical in our children's lives. 
because we've absolutely loved music, the music teachers. I had wonderful teachers growing up, you know, people that were second mothers to me, but my children have had wonderful teachers too. And there was one in particular that we thought, what if we could just like put her in a bottle? You know, what if we could just take everything that makes her magical and, you know, put, put it, you know, offer it to the world. And we started doing some research and we saw that some studio management tools already existed. And so I was interested in actually acquiring one of those companies that already existed. Yeah. And this is kind of a business tactic that I'm not sure a lot of people realize is, is possible is to acquire a small business just as a normal person. <laughs> and I took out a small business association loan, an SBA loan, which is a government funded loan for buying small businesses. And I acquired something that at the time was called Music Teachers Helper. And it had actually been around for 17 years. Wow. It had a nice customer base, but the product itself, when you're dealing with software, the product is code, right? Yeah. And it's something that you can't really see. And if you don't know, you know, if you're not a developer yourself, it's a bit mysterious, but the code really needed to be rebuilt. It wasn't the kind of thing where we could go in and just kind of patch it up a little bit. We really figured out that we we needed to start from scratch. And and unfortunately it took us about a year to figure that out. And so it was a long year of just like, what can we do to improve this product and to, you know, bring it up to the standards of today. And once we kind of decided that we needed to rebuild the whole thing, it was both a moment of dread and a moment of relief, right? <laughs> and I think so. And one of the things you shared, you know, from being this, this super confident, you know, young entrepreneur to realizing that, oh, there's, there's dues to be paid and, and in your transition. And, and even when you're now creating this incredible platform for music educators, which is really designed to help them manage their studios and they do need confidence. And I think, you know, I've certainly explored the platform and I'm just blown away by the changes that you've implemented. And, what has sort of been, you know, the success stories of teachers and how have they really benefited from your platform? Yeah, that's a great question. So with software, there's a theory that you start with your minimum viable product, the MVP. And we really took that to heart in building the new duet. The duet, the legacy product, as I mentioned, had been is is the result of 17 years of development. And it has all sorts of bells and whistles. And it's it has all the things. <laughs> yeah. And with this new product, we really wanted to strip it down to what are the very basic things that help music teachers feel confident in running their businesses. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of interviews with teachers. I personally interviewed probably close to 100 teachers asking them, what is it that you're looking for in a software partner? Are you looking to save time? Are you looking to save money? Are you looking for just confidence within your interactions with your parents? Are you looking for a professional brand and face to put to your small business? You know, and we we took all of those learnings and we decided that we were going to start with just a couple of key features. Yeah. So the product that's out there now just has these uh, these few features, but we're we're anxiously working on adding to them. But of the three features that we've launched, we've launched a studio information organizer. So basically roster management. Yeah. We've organized a calendar. I mean, we've, we've built a calendar, which works just like a G, you know, Gmail, a, a Google calendar or an iCal, sends reminders uh, about lessons and upcoming events. And then we created a daily dashboard, which allows teachers to log in, easily see their schedule, click on each lesson as it happens. And add the notes for that lesson and mark the attendance for that lesson and then move on to the next one. So awesome. we really learned from our teachers that that ease of use was very important. Mm -hmm. So we built that into this first product. But I will say the most important thing that we learned from these interviews that I really hadn't seen before was the pain that comes around scheduling a new teaching season. Mm -hmm. So there's there's definitely pain around rescheduling and filling in gaps with cancellations and trial and things like and we're getting there. We're we're getting there. We're getting there. But we landed on one of the most important things we could lead with was this idea of how do I get to the beginning of a school year or January or a summer and put all my students together in a schedule that will work for both me and them. Yeah. And we learned from teachers that this process takes dozens of hours and it's really painful and they call it schedule Tetris and they do it through 
texts back and forth to parents, or some of them use Google Forms, or some will just do it in emails, or some will, you know, I one teacher say, if they can't make the same time they had last year, then I'm going to drop them as a student because it's just too painful to reorganize the whole thing, right? Yes. So we is yeah. I so our big innovation with this initial product was something called the season scheduler, the smart season scheduler. And this is a this is a a an algorithmic process. So we're using technology to automate that process of pairing a teacher's availability with her student's availability. And it's all done through text messages and forms that the parents fill out. And when the system has received the teacher's teaching times and the student's availability, it magically pairs them up through an algorithm that's running on the back end. And it spits out a calendar that works for everybody. And so we, we've we had a huge success with that this season as, te- as teachers have been preparing for their, you know, their fall teaching schedules. And we had one teacher who has 48 students. Wow. And she said, she said that she's like, you know what? I just, I don't want to do this again. If, if people can't make their same time, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't teach them again. And she said, but I'll try, I'll try this. We'll see how this works. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to help her schedule 48 students Monday through Friday in, you know, her teaching blocks, her preferred teaching blocks and do all of it through text and forms that the parents participated in. And just a few texts later, the parents got a confirmation. This is your, this is your time. And she started her teaching schedule a couple of weeks ago and it's all right there. So yeah, it took oh my God. Maybe, maybe an hour. That is incredible. I mean, you've really led the world of innovation, obviously rebrand and rebuild of duet partner over the last couple of years. This is a huge impact on teachers because I think in today's world, teachers want to be focused on teaching, on professional development, on innovation in their teaching studios. What can they do to have the sticky factor, right? So their students, you know, stay with them and love them. But one of the pain points is all of that time consuming business management. And I think you know, you have created these exciting changes and improvements. And obviously it's taken a lot of time for you as well. So music teachers, they're, they're juggling all these multiple responsibilities. How, what are some of the other things that you've added just to kind of simplify these daily tasks so they can improve their studio management? Yeah. So I'm very excited about everything that we have coming up next. The, we are working on two big projects right now. One is the ability to use that smart scheduling capability for individual lessons. So if somebody wants to reschedule or if somebody wants a trial lesson with you, then you you can sort of establish your availability, send out a text to that student, have them self-schedule their lesson and have it just automatically appear on your calendar. So that's one thing we're working on. And then of course, the next thing we're working on is is digital payment systems, right? Mm -hmm. So making it really easy for teachers to be able to collect their payment and be able to report on those payments in the system in a way that allows them to do their tax preparation easily, et cetera. So, you know, we, we really, in those interviews that I talked about, we really learned that teachers want confidence. They feel very unsure of the tasks that are needed to run a small business. You know, we, as teachers, uh, you've put in your 10,000 hours to be an expert in your instrument. And we have so much respect for that. But, you know, that same amount of of training hasn't gone into how to run a small business. And so we see our job as being that tool that gives teachers the confidence and the professionalism that they're looking for to match the skills that they have in their particular instrument or musical discipline. Yeah, you just you just really nailed all those points so well. Nyla, and I know for myself, you know, in starting to teach, you know, many years ago, and you're right, we we put in our 10,000 hours as music educators, but there is no business training and well, how do I collect this? And so you land up, you know, cash, post-dated checks, e-transfers, this, that, the other thing. So that's one thing is just the whole financial aspect, especially when you have a lot of students. And then the next thing comes with the scheduling. 
And then the next thing comes with communication. So now you're sending text message, you're on Skype, you're on email, you're on Zoom, you're picking up the phone. Like there's so many things and they're so time consuming. And the fact that Duet Partner is simplifying all of these tasks is mind boggling. And how do you see sort of the success of your your teachers? How are they implementing these, these improvements in their studio? Well, you know, we we have had teachers that have been with our old product. So the teachers that I acquired through uh, the acquisition of, of Music Teachers Helper, who have been on that platform for over a decade. You know, yeah, that, and that's a, in in software land. That's that's a huge level of commitment to a particular product. And so, you know, we we really hear from teachers all the time who say that this helps them save time. Right? It helps them have that confidence. But, you know, they also feel like it's a way that they can sort of, they can professionalize their studios beyond just being at home behind your piano or with your guitar or whatever it is. Because I think sometimes when we're just at home behind our piano and people are coming by, you know, it, we can feel small. We can feel like it's just, we're just one person sort of, you know, duking it out with the, with the parents and, and trying to, trying to collect the payments. And I think the teachers that have been with Duet for a long time feel like they have a a team behind them. They feel like they can act and carry themselves uh, with more confidence than if they're just by themselves trying to figure out their own policies, trying to, you know, manage those emotional relationships with parents and so we really see that as one of our responsibilities is to help the teachers feel like they've got a whole team behind them. Some of these relationships can be very emotional, right? There can be very emotional conversations with parents about payment or rescheduling or levels of commitment, right? Yes. And sometimes we we like to joke at Duet that like, you know, you would never treat your therapist or a yoga instructor the same way or a doctor the same way sometimes people treat their music teachers, Right. Yes. Oh, sorry, we're going out of town this weekend. Forgot to tell you, you know, uh, we're just going to have to miss our lesson today. You know, sorry, it's vacation. Or I can't pay you this week. Would you mind just still teaching her and I'll get back to you another time, right? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't do that to some other service provider. And and listen, I'm I'm a parent. I'm not even a teacher. So I'm not bashing parents. I know it happens to the best of us. I've certainly, you know, had my fair share of, of faux pas with teachers myself. But I do think that, I do hope that one of the things we're doing is allowing music teachers to say, hey, this is my livelihood, you know, and I can be respected for that. And I can have the tools that I need to show parents how, how professional I am and demand that respect that comes mm-hmm. with being such a skilled practitioner of your of your instrument. Yeah, 100%. I mean, when you think about it, if you want to go to Walmart and you're there after hours, you can't knock on the door and say, hey, this is a convenient yeah. <laughs> time for me. Can I come in? I mean, they'll say, go away. We are not open right now. And you're right. Parents often think, oh, can I just reschedule? And, and you know, having a platform like Duet Partner, it gives you an opportunity as a professional music business owner to say, here's my, my makeup lesson schedule. And you might have something blocked off. And if it's full, then the answer is no, or even having those policies, or I think it's just a cool idea to feel like, yes, I have a system that I can refer to and it can help me grow my business because now I can spend more time teaching and I don't have to spend all these extra hours doing all of these. And it's a lot of work. I mean, you are saving them time and that if you save time, you're going to be making more money per hour rather than dividing it up. I often say, how much do you charge, you know, per hour in your teaching business? And teachers might say, well, this is my fee. And I say, but then when you think about all the hours you spend, you're actually not making, you know, 50, $60 an hour, you're making about 10 bucks, right? So how can we kind of help you? But I have a question for you. Let's go deep here, young lady. On a lighter note, since we're all music enthusiasts here and musicians slash educators, entrepreneurs, If you could have a jam session with any musician, living or deceased, who would it be and why? (laughs) Well, you know, when I was a senior in high school, I did an independent study for my last year of of high school where I wrote a one-woman play about Frédéric Chopin from the point of view of Georges Sand, who was his lover and who was a French novelist. 
And as a pianist, of course, I'd played a lot of Chopin and I just, of course, love Chopin. And as the parent of a violinist and cellist, I mean, he wrote a, a cello sonata, but I'm kind of sad that there hasn't been more Chopin in my home of the last couple of decades as I've been raising my kids. But I always go back to Chopin as sort of my my comfort composer. And in that one woman show, I wrote a narrative from the point of view of Georges Sand talking about Chopin's life. And then I punctuated it with performing 10 pieces myself on the piano, sort of corresponding to these different scenes in his life. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm not actively performing as a musician right now. As I said, I'm mostly an appreciator and an audience member these days. So I can't really see myself sitting down with somebody and playing along with them, but I would love to meet Chopin. And I would love to have heard him play live because he was such a legendary performer. And I just, it's one of those things kind of like Bach too, where like, what did it really sound like in his day, you know, with the instruments that they had available to them? So I definitely like to meet Chopin and hear him. And then in terms of actually playing with somebody, I was raised by an opera singer to be her accompanist in residence. I think she was very strategic about raising me as a pianist because she yes. knew she was always going to need an accompanist. And I started accompanying my mom when I was actually about 10 years old, just on some simple things. But eventually I was her recital accompanist and we did you know, all, all the arias, all the musical theater, lots of sacred music. And unfortunately my mom passed away about five years ago. So if I had, could I have it, if I could just sit down and have a jam session and perform with anybody, it would be my mom. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry for her passing, but she's, you know, you are so blessed to have had that special time with your mom and music is so dear to our hearts. And it is just almost that unspoken connection. When we think about even I'm sure you experienced, she would give you a look and you would know exactly what she meant. And, <laughs> and, and, and the nod that just said, you did a great job today. Like I, you know, you were right there with me. Like it, it is just such a unspoken word that, that happens between musicians on stage and singers, right. Where you just, yep. you know, you feel it. It's just this, this energy that you feel between the two of you. And um, what a blessing that you got to share that time. And now you're passing it on to your kids. Yes, it is. It's wonderful. I love playing for my kids. Yeah. Wow. So what advice do you have for these aspiring music teachers looking to make a really meaningful impact in the field of music education? And especially now, because, you know, you mentioned, gee, I wish I could hear or have attended a live concert of Beethoven or Chopin. And when we think of it, now we have an opportunity, especially in, in the advancing age of technology. So what would you, what advice would you have for music teachers? Well, that's a great question. I would say that music these days is more important than ever because it is a respite and it is a, it's a panacea to, to the digital world. I and mean, despite the fact that a lot of our music is still consumed digitally, we're seeing huge spikes in attendance at live performances. Yeah. And that's all sorts of live performances, certainly popular music, but actually classical music too is having a huge spike in, in its attendance and live performance. And I think that that's a really fascinating trend. We're also seeing, for instance, that I think I read a statistic yesterday that 83% of the music streamed on Spotify is more than 20 years old. Wow. You know, and my my daughter actually came to me the other day and we were talking about it. And she she said, she told me that the, her most listened to song on Spotify of that week, this is a 17 year old, was Bye Bye Miss American Pie. <laughs> and I don't know if in Canada that's as popular, but. Yep. Yep. No, it will. I mean, that, how old is that song? It's yes. decades old, right? Isn't yeah. it from the 70s or 60s? Yeah. And I just thought that's, and, and my kids follow a lot of new new popular music too. But I think that the statistics are showing that, that music consumers are interested in things that have a little bit more proven cultural weight to them, right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and, that, and that's including the idea of going to live performances and coming together as communities. And so I think as music educators, we need, we need to encourage that. I'm actually surprised that I, when I meet music teachers, that there isn't more, it's rare for me to meet a music teacher who really has a listening plan built into her studio requirements, right? 
whether it is just your Spotify or Apple Music digital music listening or go to a live performance. I think one of the things that we, uh, some advice I would have for music teachers as I've met hundreds of them over the last few years, if I could suggest anything is encourage the development of future audiences as well as the development of the musician in the moment, because it's more likely that the student is going to be an, an audience member in the future than that they're going to go, go on to be, you know, a professional musician or an active, mm -hmm. an active player in their adulthood. And we need to develop those audiences and we need to encourage people to go to live performance Yes, um, and to support those who are making their careers and livelihoods out of being professional musicians. And so I do think the music educator has a responsibility, not just to teach an instrument and to teach technique and skills and theory, but also teach the, the habit of listening and going to live performance. Yeah, that is really, really good advice. I think too, when you sometimes you're, you're, you just nailed it because so many times we do, we're just so focused on teaching the lesson, but why not take a second to say, Hey, what, what do you, what do you got on your playlist? What kind of music are mm -hmm. you listening to? Let's analyze yeah. that. Let's go to, you know, I remember taking my students to, to the concert hall. We went to see opera. We went, we experienced a lot of things. My students performed at the concert hall in Musicians in the Making, which is a program where uh, they invited music teachers. You had to be selected. And fortunately they picked me. So my students got to perform multiple times, but it was about the, not only attending, but then having that experience and sharing that as a group and also listening to each other right? So it's not just about, oh, me, I'm playing this, but listen to your colleague. And it's about sharing that. And I think live performances, thank goodness, are, are back and thriving. And it's really an opportunity for us to do that. So I love that idea. So as Nyland said, take your students to concerts, listen to live music. And also, isn't it interesting? Here's a fun fact. Let's think about this. We're going to go to the concert hall and see the symphony. What kind of an audience member are you? Well, you wait <laughs> until there is the polite silence at the end of the movement. Do not applaud between movements, heaven yeah. forbid. Wait until the end and then polite applause. You go to a rock concert, you better be standing on your feet, screaming your head off through the entire thing, right? Going from one thing to the other. So I think it's always makes me smile. And I remember having to educate my students. This is what happens when you go to this kind of a performance, right? It's a little bit different, but it's just been great yeah. fun hearing all of these tips and tricks from you, uh, Nylon. So Duet Partner is described as the only studio manager worthy of an encore. And we know that from attending <laughs> conferences and performances. So can you share maybe a little, a fun anecdote or, or a client testimonial that really, you know, gives this idea of Duet Partner receiving an encore? Yeah. Well, actually, one one that I'll mention is the feedback that we've received from parents. This isn't something that I think we think about a lot, but uh, we have been hearing from parents that they appreciate the ease of the season scheduling process specifically. So that's that process that I mentioned where the parent just has to fill out their availability of their student and send it back and then they receive their lesson time. And so, yeah, we've been, it's been great hearing from, from teach from parents who say, wow, this was the easiest process I've, you know, participated in, in years. And I love just getting the reminders via text and, and it just feels easy and professional and efficient. So we've really loved that. So yeah, I encourage teachers who are listening to give Duet a try. We do have a free trial period. Uh, you can go in and set up your, your student roster add some lessons to the calendar, start sending out email uh, text reminders and, and event notices, and be able to track your lesson notes and your attendance in your account. And if you join now, you will be able to become familiar with those features. And then we will be adding the digital payment system in a couple of months. The price will not change. We will just be adding these features for the same price. And uh, it's just going to get better and better. So we're really excited. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Nile. And I think that is just a huge opportunity. And what a great testimonial that when you know that parents are loving what the teachers are providing for them, it just shows it's a huge win-win. The teacher's professional, she's saving time and the parents are happy. And when parents are happy, 
they're going to stick around because they really mm-hmm. appreciate your professionalism as an educator, which really leads you to be productive and profitable in your business. And uh, it's going to be a great asset when you add that too. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. How can people learn more about Duet Partner? Yes, please go to duetpartner.com. And if you are interested in signing up for an account, go to get started free. Any one of those buttons on the site will get you started. And we encourage you to give us a try. As you subscribe to Duet, you actually can use a coupon code that we've created especially for Glory's followers and listeners. So when you enter your credit card information to subscribe to your account, just enter G-L-O-R-Y and you'll find a special discount is available for you there. Oh, thank you so much. So don't forget to add Glory, G-L-O-R-Y. And thank you very kindly for your generosity for our listeners. We'll put all of that in the show notes so you'll get to use your special coupon code. And do give Duet Partner a try. I know you're going to absolutely love it. And thank you again, Nyland, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Till next time, here's to your ultimate teaching success with productivity and profitability. Bye now. Thanks for listening to the Ultimate Music Teacher's Productivity and Profitability Podcast. Together, we can transform lives through the power of music education. I invite you to explore what's possible for your musical journey inside our UMT community. Simply join our Ultimate Music Teacher's private Facebook group, where we network, answer questions, host live events, and connect on a deeper level. Here's to your ultimate music teaching success with productivity and profitability. Till next time, teach with passion. Thank you.